Hello, we are going to talk about the moment of inertia for objects. So moment of inertia is this idea when you are trying to apply torque to an object. So imagine you have a screw and then you have a wrench which you're trying to twist that screw. And as you twist, you are trying to push or maybe push this way uh, and try and untwist that screw. But you know when you start to untwist a bolt, it takes a little bit of oof until you can finally twist it. A little bit of extra force before it starts twisting. Well, that is the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia of that bolt or that screw. It is an object's resistance to being twisted. It's resistance to torque because torque is, of course, the force of of twisting that wrench. So moment of inertia is its resistance to that. And there's a formula to measure how great that moment of inertia is. It's I equals mR squared. So the moment of inertia, which is I, is equal to the mass times the, I'll say, the distance the object is from the rotation. It's one way to say it. It's your radius, okay? So one thing to think about, um, we'll do a problem where you're standing there and you are holding a baton with a ball at the end and you start twirling it. The radius would be that value where the mass is that point right there. So the radius, the distance between the point of rotation and your mass or your object. And so I want to point out that this is a point mass. So we're talking about like here, if you're twirling that baton and the mass right here um, is the mass being rotated and the rod is a negligible mass, like we don't even account for it. That's the type. If it's not a point mass, uh, like kind of like our screw here being rotated, the mass is now distributed around the screw. Um, or you have a spinning disc of some sort or a spinning cube or a spinning rod that's heavy. The moment of inertia um, formula is going to look a little different. So this is the different formulas for different shapes. And now you can have even different shapes and more formulas, but these are some of the basic ones. Uh, for example, that disc we're talking about, the formula is now one half mR squared. You're twirling a rod where you're holding it um, at one end and spinning it, one-third. If the rotation is in the middle of it, it's one-twelfth mR squared, or they say L for length of the rod. A spinning sphere, two-fifths mR squared. Because the thing is, we have to change it because the mass, instead of at a single point right here, and all of the mass is in that point, and then you are spinning it right here, the mass is distributed around the sphere, okay? There's also this idea that the radius of rotation is going to be different because it's from the radius from the rotation to where the mass is. But if your mass is distributed all over, the radius is constantly changing. For most objects, you kind of take the average radius, which the average radius is the outer radius. So that's why you can take the radius of the sphere, radius of the cylinder, radius of the hoop, uh, length of the rod, or here you even have length and width of a rectangular object. To develop these formulas, it relies on calculus, and you're taking an integral of your moment of inertia formula. Um, but that's kind of the behind the scenes of how they come up with these formulas. But thankfully, someone has done that work, so we now have the formulas to work with. And so now with the basics out of the way, let's try this problem. So we got a twirling baton, we've been talking about that. A thin rod with two round objects at each end. The length of the rod, or the length of the baton, is 0.66 meters. And the mass of each is 0.3 kilograms. Find the moment of inertia of the baton if it is rotated about an axis at the midpoint between the two round objects. So what if my axis of rotation 
comes right here through the middle. What is the moment of inertia if the axis is moved to one end? Okay, um, so first of all, we'll do this idea if it's in the middle. Um, and it says the mass of the rod is negligible compared to the mass of the objects at the end. That's important because this means we're dealing with a point mass. So I can say my I equals MR squared. My moment of inertia equals the mass times the radius squared. If I had to account for the, the mass of the rod, I would then have to use that other formula from that chart. But in this case, it's kind of a point mass. We're saying all of my mass is distributed in each of these balls. Okay, so when we do this, we have to split this one into two problems. The first one, we deal with this one. What is the moment of inertia of our first mass? And then we'll talk about the moment of inertia of the second one, which it's going to be equal because it's split in half equal on both sides. So my moment of inertia is the mass right here times the radius, which is the distance from the rotation to the object. So that's 0.33. We divide the rod in half, 0.33 squared. And we can multiply all of that, and we end up with 0 0.033. What are the units? Well, we can determine those pretty easy. Mass is kilogram, radius is measured in meters, and it's squared. So there you go, kilograms per meter squared. An odd unit, um, but that's what it is. And then now uh, we can calculate our second one, which is just going to be the double of this. So let's multiply by 2. You get 0 0.066. Multiply by 2 again because I have to calculate the moment of inertia of both those objects. So the inertia is 0 0.066 kilograms meters squared. And then it says, what is the moment of inertia if the axis is moved to one end of the rod? So now we have the same here, but now I'm rotating from right here. What happens then? Well, again, we have to think about moment of inertia of this object and this object. What is I1? Well, in this case, the mass is 0 0.3, but the radius is 0. That's where we're rotating from. So this guy has 0. Hey, that's awesome. The second one, well, now the radius is the full 0 0.66. So we have the mass times 0 0.66 squared, and we multiply all of that, creating a 0 0.13 kilograms meters squared. So we have our two different moments of inertia. Which one is greater? Well, this one, when I rotate at the end of it. So when you rotate something in the middle or you're further away from where you're rotating, the moment of inertia is going to be less. Uh, you could even try this out on your own. If you grab a book, if you grab one end of it and try and, in your hand and rotate it, you will notice it takes a little more effort to start that thing twisting than if you were to grab it in the middle of the book right there and try and twist it. It's going to be easier. So now from this example, we need to now talk about Newton's second law of rotational motion. So here we go. Newton's second law of rotational motion. So the angular acceleration, which is our A right there, our alpha, of an object about a particular axis equals the net torque on the object divided by the moment of inertia. Um, so we can go to our baton, it's swinging around, and we're wondering what's the acceleration of that, the angular acceleration. The acceleration, you know, kind of like change in velocity over change in time, um, the more acceleration you're going to have is if there's a less moment of inertia. Think if it's easy to start it start it swinging around, it's going to go faster. If it's hard to swing it around, it's going to go slower. Just like um, kind of opposite with the torque, that's your force. If you apply less torque, it's going to have less acceleration. You apply more torque, more force, going to have more acceleration. 
So this is angular acceleration, which important to remember, there is an alternate way to find angular acceleration. I should draw a fancy W because uh, we've been using Greek letters for it. Write the change in angular velocity divided by the change in time. So we have two different ways. So depending on the information we're given, we can find angular acceleration with that or with that. And then finally, as we deal with this formula, I can multiply by I, and I now have a separate formula for torque, the net torque on it. Which there, remember, we have a separate formula for torque, the force times the radius times sine theta. So now, depending on the information we're given, we can find torque in two different ways. Interesting. And one last thing. I said the last thing last time, but one more about this. This is Newton's second law for rotational motion. I think you'll notice a similarity between his second law of motion, normal motion, which is force equals acceleration times mass, or mass times acceleration. See how just in this circular context, things change a little bit. So we have torque instead of straight force. We have angular acceleration instead of acceleration. And we have moment of inertia, which is dependent upon an object's mass instead of straight mass. Okay, here we go. We got our problem. I included the torque formula in case we have forgotten it as well. Um, we have a solid steel wheel is free to rotate about a motionless central axis. Okay, steel wheel. Here's our axis. Draw it out. Always draw your diagrams. So it's a wheel, so I'm trying to give it a little three dimensions there. It has a mass of 15 kilograms. A diameter of 0.44 meters. Which, you know what? Let's just write the radius, because we almost always use radius. So 0.22 meters for the radius. It starts at rest. And then you want to spin this. You want to apply torque on this somehow to increase the wheel's rotation from 8 revolutions per second. Or from 0 to 8 revolutions per second. So we want our, our velocity. So I'll put W because our angular velocity to be 8 revolutions per second. And that to take 15 seconds. What torque must be applied. Okay, we've got to unravel a lot here. First of all, we have, first of all, we can think torque is force times the radius times sine theta, but I don't know what force is being applied to this. You know, someone's going to spin this somehow. I don't know how much force they have to spin it. So maybe not that one. What about torque? Uh, it's also equal to angular acceleration times moment of inertia. Hmm, maybe I can do something there. I think I can find angular acceleration because right here I have velocity and I have time. So I can find angular acceleration because that's change in angular velocity divided by change in time. Time is easy, that's 15 seconds. What about the change in velocity? You might be tempted to say, well, I'm going from 8 to 0 to 8, so 8 minus 0, the change is 8. But remember, when we do this angular velocity, we have to have it in radians per second, not just revolutions. So if I do one revolution per second, how many radians per second is that? Remember, a revolution talks about going around in a circle. So if I go around a circle one whole time, what is my theta? What is my angle measure? We should know that one time around the circle is 2 pi radians. So if I'm going one revolution per second, I'm going 2 pi radians per second. And so we need to convert. If I'm going 8 pi revolutions per second, I'm going to multiply this by 2 pi, and that is actually 16 pi revolutions, sorry, 16 pi radians per second. So instead of 8 minus 0, we're going 16 pi minus 0, 
and that is giving me 16 pi over 15, which I can do a little reduction here, and we go 3.4 rads per second. Okay, that's a pretty important number right there, our ex uh, angular acceleration. But I still need moment of inertia. Well, how about we try that? Moment of inertia is equal to mr squared. But that's if it's a point mass, being, or a singular mass being rotated. In this case, I have a wheel. So you need to look up in your formulas, what if I have a wheel or a cylinder, right? What is the shape? It's a cylinder. In this case, it's 1 half mr squared. Um, and so we can go 1 half times the mass of the wheel, uh, they said is 15. The radius then of the wheel, the radius of the cylinder, that's 0.22, and we already established that. So 0.22 squared. Um, and that's going to end up with 0 0.36 kilograms times meters squared. Actually wasn't too bad to find the moment of inertia. So we go back. And we can put in the moment of inertia, 0 0.36. And guess what? I can find my torque. So my torque is, we'll get our little circle drawing out of the way, 0.34 times, 0.36 times 3.4 equals 1.2 newton meters. That is my torque. Good job, good job, guys. That is part A. What torque must be applied? 1.2 newton meters. And then they say, if you apply the torque by wrapping a strap around the outside of the wheel, how much force do you exert on the strap? So this is this idea. Someone uh, takes a strap, wraps it around, and then they're going to they're gonna pull right here, and that's going to cause the wheel to spin. It's kind of, if you've ever had a lawnmower, and you've pulled to start it, or a weed whacker, or any engine that you have to pull that string to start it, it works this way. There's a cord wrapped around an engine block, and you pull it to make it spin fast until it creates enough force or power to start the engine. So someone's doing that. How much force do they have to apply? Now we get to finally go up to this formula, because this one involves my straight up force, the force you have to pull. Um, and so I have my force well, I should say I have my torque of 1.2 equals the force, um, and then the radius is 0.22, and it's applied directly or perpendicular to the, the rotation. See, we're perpendicular right here, so I don't need to worry about the sine theta. It's sine 90, so it's 1. Um, so we end up with 1.2 divided by 0.22, which equals the force, and we complete that, and it is a 5.5 newtons. So someone has to pull with 5.5 newtons, um, and that will create the corresponding torque. And so that is our talk, a moment of inertia, and a couple problems, especially this difficult one. Uh, and so hopefully that helped.